I know he got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon under supervision of Manuel Bloom. Uh, now he is a professor in Stanford University. And Ryan has a number of great results, so probably starting from his uh, optimal algorithm for uh, constraints function problem and uh, some other results, and the recent result about uh, breaks result in uh, circuit complexity. Uh, Ryan showed actually that uh, some big class doesn't contain some small class, but uh, <laughs> it's obvious, but nobody uh, was able to prove it during like 30 years. Yeah, so. Right. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, so I guess my, uh, I would like to start with a disclaimer that you're being subjected to an experiment. Okay. So this, this lecture is not the usual kind of lecture where I will go through lots of details of proofs and, and uh, teach you uh, the proofs of various statements. So this, this is a lecture that is intended to uh, encourage you to think about a topic that is not very well understood. So it's, we're so ignorant about it that I think uh, talented students have about as much advantage as experts. Um, so I would like to just promote a certain topic, which is not well understood and still not being studied by many people, um, in the hopes that you will see it's, how interesting it is and maybe take it up for yourself. And it's exactly this sort of topic that uh, led me to recent results in circuit complexity. And I think that it's the beginning of a bunch of new results, and we're just getting started. So, so this will just be a high-level survey. So my plan is in the first lecture, the first 50 minutes, to give a high-level survey of things, and then the next 50 minutes to give you some more details. But it may simply be that the, the survey is so interesting it will take the whole time. Um, we'll, we'll see. Okay. So let's start at the, at the very beginning. So, um, so let's just recall the traditional view of algorithms and complexity theory. So this is the view from 50,000 feet. So we have two camps of people. We have algorithm designers, and we have another camp of people called complexity theorists. And the algorithm designers, they generally ask questions like, uh, what makes some problems easy to solve? When can I find an efficient algorithm for some problem? I want to make some positive progress in the world. I want to find some new methods for solving problems. Okay, that's the algorithm designer, um, in a nutshell. And the complexity theorists asked another question. So they, they want to know about the intrinsic difficulty of problems. So they want to know what makes other problems difficult. Uh, when can we prove that a problem is not easy? So what, what structure in problems make them easy versus hard? And uh, more technically, they asked, it's basically the same question, but with different words. When can we prove a lower bound on the resources needed to solve a problem? So when we have an algorithm and it runs efficiently in some time, we ha say we have some upper bound on the running time. And so a complexity theorist is looking for proving lower bounds, proving that any algorithm solving a particular problem is going to take necessarily take um, some unreasonable amount of time. So, so they want to prove a lower bound. Okay? So, so these are the traditional views. And it seems obvious that the tasks of the algorithm designer and the complexity theorist are completely opposite ones. Right, one is trying to find an algorithm and one is trying to prove that there is none. Okay, so it's basically by definition in a certain sense. Um, furthermore, it's generally believed that lower bounds are somehow much harder than algorithm design. Okay, and there are many different sort of reasons for this. Um, so one is that in algorithm design, somehow we only have to find a single algorithm that's going to solve the problem on all possible instances of the problem. But in lower bounds, it appears we need to do something much stronger than that. We have to reason about all possible algorithms, even ones that are so clever we weren't smart enough to come up with them. And some, no matter how clever they are, we have to say that, the, that they're not going to work well, no matter what. And so this just seems inherently harder uh, to us. It just seems like the kind of problem that we're just not good at. We're good at solving problems, but showing that you cannot solve a problem, this, this just seems much harder. And this belief is strongly reflected in the literature. So if you look at the number of great algorithms papers published each year, it's an order of magnitude or, or more than the number of lower bounds papers. So there really is this huge discrepancy in, in communities even in the sizes of people who try to design algorithms, people who try to prove lower bounds. Okay? So, so these are the traditional views. And when you think about the intersection of 
of algorithms and complexity, you naturally uh, come across sort of foundational questions. And sort of the most popular one is, of course, uh, the P equals NP question, which, just to recall, says if finding, uh, if verifying a solution to a problem is easy, then is finding a solution to this problem also easy? Okay, so who here has seen P and NP? Just want to show of hands. Okay, so practically everyone, right? Uh, who hasn't seen P and NP? Okay, all right, so I'll skip this. <laughs> no, so basically, um, so we have these notions of polynomial time, and we have these notions of, of NP. And so NP is essentially the, the problems for which uh, when they have a solution, they have a very short solution. And so, and verifying the solution can be done efficiently. Whereas problems in P are problems that you can simply solve efficiently. Okay? And we want to know the difference between these. And of course, uh, the biggest open lower bound is uh, that P is different from NP. So we believe that finding a solution is strictly harder than verifying the correctness of a given solution uh, when this solution can be verified efficiently. So, I mean, this is just our own intuition that um, solving problems, you know, proving theorems in math is much harder than just verifying a theorem step by step, the proof of theorem, okay? So, so just to talk a bit about, uh, more about lower bounds, so what are they good for? So they're impossibility results. They're just saying, they seem to just be saying, well, you can't do that. And that doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that there's a productive statement. But in fact, lower bounds can be good in, in many ways. So one is algorithm engineering. So if we show that a problem is really hard to solve in a particular mathematical formalization, well, there are many different ways to take real world problems and translate them to math. So when we show that a particular formalization is difficult, it steers us away from, from these difficult ones and encourages us to try other things. So, so this uh, notion of steering away has led to things like uh, probably most prominently approximation algorithms. So try, rather than trying to solve a problem exactly, try to find an approximate solution, or maybe rather than trying to solve a problem in polynomial time, try to solve it in something less than exhaustive search, uh, but maybe more than polynomial time. So, so in a certain sense, having knowing the boundary between uh, feasible and infeasible lets us uh, find more productive formalizations. So there have been uh, sort of unexpected lower bounds uh, applications. So one is in machine learning, where techniques for proving lower bounds were actually useful in developing ways of learning uh, functions when those functions can be modeled uh, using these class of algorithms. So basically, the idea is that if you can show that this class of algorithms is limited in a certain sense, then you, you have so much knowledge about this class of algorithms that you can also learn this class of algorithms. If I just give you, say, inputs and outputs from a function modeled by such an algorithm, you can eventually learn such an algorithm. Okay? So in a certain sense, this is both, both are talking about weaknesses of the algorithm class. The fact that you can learn something is, in a certain sense, a weakness of the algorithm class. Okay? But another obvious application is in cryptography and security. So basically all of modern cryptography is based on the assumption that various strong lower bounds are in fact true. And uh, pretty much all of them are just open problems. Even much, much weaker things are open problems. But nevertheless, this lower bounds are basically necessary for implementing cryptographic primitives. There have to be problems which are easy to solve in one way but difficult to say invert. Um, so being able to say something is difficult necess necessitates having a lower bound on a problem. Okay. And another application is uh, in so-called pseudorandom generators. So many problems can be solved efficiently when you're assumed you have access to uniform independent random bits. So you just assume there is some fair coin you can toss. It will come up heads or tails of probability a half. And the co coin tosses are independent. And when you make this assumption that you have access to such a coin, you can prove that a certain algorithm will solve a problem with, with high probability. Well, pseudorandom generators are a proposal to, to take any feasible algorithm of this kind, of this randomized kind, and turn it into a deterministic algorithm. So it will generate a sequence of coin flips, deterministic sequence of coin flips, that can, you can just use to systematically replace the random coin flips, and yet the algorithm 
will have uh, the, the same input output behavior as it did on the randomness. So it turns out that lower bounds, in fact, lower bounds around the kind of, of this NX thing or this thing that uh, was mentioned earlier, the, even weak lower bounds can be used to, to develop pseudorandom generators. So, so basically, it's, because of this, it's believed that randomness is actually not so helpful in computation and that any randomized algorithm can be replaced with essentially equivalent uh, deterministic one. Okay? So these are some known applications of lower bounds. But uh, sort of the big thing is that we don't know everything that lower bounds could be good for because we really have no idea what the proofs of strong lower bounds look like. We have no idea how to get started proving things like P different from NP. And so as far as we know, developing proofs of lower bounds could imply much, much more about computation. So in a certain sense, they're one of the great scientific mysteries of our time because so much uh, of online commerce relies on these things being true, and yet we are very, very far from having any idea about uh, whether or not they're, they're true or how to prove them. I mean, we believe they're true, but we don't know how to prove them. Okay? So, so why are these things so hard to prove? Um, well, complexity theorists have been very good at, at identifying precisely why they can't prove various statements. They're, they're really good at being pessimists. Uh, so there are many no-go theorems in complexity theory. Basically, so they have various technical names like relativization, natural proofs, algebraization. Forget these technical names. These things say in a nutshell that the common proof techniques that we use to reason about things in complexity and algorithms are simply not good enough to prove even weak lower bounds, things much weaker than P different from NP. Okay? And so not only can we not prove this stuff, but we can prove that we cannot prove this stuff. Okay? And this has led to a, a lot of uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Um, there's a lot of great pessimism in complexity theory. Okay? So, so this talk is uh, about an a, a new topic that um, is intended directly to remove this pessimism by finding connections between algorithms and lower bounds. So it, it, it may be eventually that the difference between algorithms and lower bounds could only be psychological than anything else. Um, so, so my thesis is that uh, algorithm design is at least as hard as proving lower bounds. And this is totally contrary to this uh, conventional wisdom that there are all these algorithms papers out there and, and very, very few lower bounds papers. But when you look at the right algorithm design problems, still problems that we would like to solve, uh, making progress on these problems, even the tiny amount of progress, can imply great progress in lower bounds. So there are deep connections between the two. And so deep that we can often turn them into the same. We can say that uh, designing an interesting algorithm for this problem x is in fact equivalent to proving a lower bound against this problem y. Now, to say such a statement, you have to be very careful because uh, the computational model changes, the algorithm changes, lots of different things change. Okay? But just some intuition for, for what I, I mean. Uh, so think of what a typical theorem from algorithm design says. So from one of your algorithm's courses, there's some theorem that says here's an algorithm A and it solves my problem and it does in, say, so much time, and it does it on all possible instances of the problem. Okay, so it's some, typically what we study is a worst case algorithm, and it works on all possible instances. Whatever problem it's solving, it works on all instances. Okay? Whereas a typical theorem from lower bounds, the kind of theorem that we'd like to prove, but we don't know how, is say something like here is a proof that my problem cannot be solved on all possible algorithms from some given class. And so these connections between algorithms and lower bounds I'm going to describe are really, really hinting at an analogy between uh, the algorithm A here, the proof P here, the instance of the problem here, and the algorithms here. Okay? So this is, uh, I guess, uh, this is one slide capturing the, the kind of uh, connections that I want to draw. But, but in fact, there are many, many formal theorems that actually say uh, connections which are similar to this. So in order to develop this kind of connection, um, we have to look at other models of computation besides the usual algorithms model. So the usual algorithm model 
we, are, we come up with some single algorithm, and no matter what input we give this algorithm, it will solve the problem, no matter how big the inputs get. Okay? So there's another model of computation, which is still very natural, and it was studied uh, in Russia for uh, since the 40s and 50s, at least, uh, called the logical circuit model. Okay? And this is a, a good model for modeling a finite function. So where, where the inputs are not necessarily getting arbitrarily large, but there's some finite length. Okay, so, so how many people have seen logical circuits? Almost everyone? Okay, so I'll just say some, something here so not, as to not bore you too much. So a logical circuit, it takes zero, one inputs like A, B, and C, it outputs a single bit. Along the way, it's just taking some previously computed bits and computing a new function. So here, this gate is taking the AND of A and B and sending this to the, some big OR. It's taking the AND of B and C, AND of A and C, and it's outputting the OR of, of these things, okay? So in this example, uh, this circuit outputs one if and only if at least two of the input bits are one, okay? And you can think of these things being connected up in almost any arbitrary way. You have some input somewhere, there's some logical flow bits being sent from here to here to here, and then there's some output bit. Okay. So the size or the complexity of this circuit is four, so there are four different operations here. The fan in of the AND, so the number of inputs to the AND gates is two, and the fan in of the OR is three. This is just to give you some terminology for this. And so this is a very natural model, in fact, probably the most natural model for computing a finite function where there's some fixed input length and you want to uh, just find the most efficient way of computing this function but where the inputs are a fixed length. And so typically we measure efficiency by just say taking a minimum size circuit over some choice of gates. Here we just have ands and ors but you could have other choices of, of logical gates. Okay. So here's a, a more complicated example which uh, some of you may, may find familiar. So, so this, this circuit outputs one if and only if the sum of its four inputs is uh, congruent to two modulo three, okay? And so let me explain what these different things are. So, so this is the XOR gate. Okay? So it's taking the sum of the bits and outputting uh, their parity, whether they're even or odd. This is the same as saying whether or not they're equal. Output one if they're not equal. And so this is an equality gate, so it's outputting one if and only if the two bits are equal. So if they're both one, it outputs one. If they're both zero, it out outputs one. Otherwise, it outputs zero. And these are AND gates, and these are some NOTs. And generally speaking, we don't count the NOT gates. Uh, we, just, we just count these gates that have two inputs coming in, okay? So um, some people in this room showed that, in fact, for this function, this is the smallest circuit over all Boolean functions of fan n2. So if you take all the functions that take uh, two bits of input and output a single bit, and you try to take the smallest number of such objects to compute this function on four bits, this is what you get, this six-gate function. Again, we, don't dis we discount the knots. Okay, and they, they found it using uh, satisfiability solvers. So they actually had a computer find this little program. Okay. So, so circuit complexity uh, can get sort of very tricky very quickly. Like it's not at all obvious why this thing is, is computing what I, what I say it's computing. Okay. Okay. So, so the kind of analogy I, I want uh, to draw, let me say it a little bit more explicitly. But it'll still be very abstract, but a little bit more explicit. Okay. So I want to draw an analogy between algorithms which analyze circuits, given a circuit as input, and circuit lower bounds themselves. So showing that some functions cannot be computed by logical circuits, okay? So suppose I have some Turing machine, which is a circuit analysis algorithm in the, in the following vague sense, okay? So it, it takes any possible circuit on its tape, written as a de description on its tape in some encoding, and it computes some property of the function being computed by this circuit. Okay, so it just says yes or no based on the circuit. And whatever property it's trying to compute, some non-trivial property, is going to do it on all, on all circuits from some class. Okay. 
So it's important that it, that it works on all of them. Okay. So then, uh, so I want to take such a circuit analysis algorithm and turn it into a limitation. So what I want to say is, given such an algorithm, I can find another function that is computable with a Turing machine with, that's not uh, too crazy in the amount of resources it uses. So it's computable in some Turing machine. And for all circuits uh, that were analyzed here, I can show those circuits cannot compute the function. So there's some function that's going to be computable with a Turing machine in some relatively efficient way that cannot be computed with, with the same class of circuits that I could analyze. So I want to take an algorithm which will analyze circuits effectively and turn this into a limitation on what those circuits can do. Okay. And I promise you this will be clearer later on, but this is uh, at a very high level um, what the idea is. Okay. So, so I'm going to talk uh, the rest of the talk about circuit analysis algorithms, so various uh, ways in which we typically analyze circuits. There's like a, a huge area of this. And then I'll talk about circuit complexity, which was until recently considered a totally different area, just trying to prove that, that uh, various circuit classes cannot compute interesting functions. And then I'll, I'll talk about connections between these two. So, so circuit analysis problems. So they, they can be computational problems on circuits. That's one kind of them. So in this, in this way, um, our input is, again, some logical circuit. So it's just given to the algorithm as a form of a description. And the output, the desired output of this algorithm, is some property of the function being computed by the circuit. Okay. And so the most canonical example of this is the Boolean uh, satisfiability, circuit satisfiability problem also known as circuit set. Okay. And here the input is, is just some logical circuit. And you want to decide, is the function computed by the circuit a trivial function? Is it the all zeros function? Or is there a satisfying assignment? Is there some input to the circuit which makes the circuit print one? Okay. So a fundamental theorem of computer science, also known as the Cook-Levin theorem, is that circuit set is MP complete. Okay, and this means that circuit set is very unlikely to be solvable efficiently unless p equals np. Okay. How, about, how many people have seen circuit set before? Everybody? Okay, all right. Maybe I should just stop asking and just keep lecturing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Happens three times in a row, I'm going to assume you know everything now. So. Okay, but so we can still ask if there are any algorithms that solve circuit set which are faster than the obvious brute force algorithm that just simply tries all possible settings to the inputs of the circuit and, and checks and just evaluates the circuit. So I mean, there's still some interesting ground in between polynomial time and two to the n. And we can try to ask, how well can we analyze circuits in general? Okay, This is just some sort of basic science. Like this is two to the n is kind of the stupid algorithm for trying, just trying the needle in the haystack algorithm. And we want to know if that can be beaten. So in general, um, we can have some generic version of circuit satisfiability. So, so you can take any kind of class of Boolean circuits that have various restrictions on them. Uh, so for example, you could take the class of logical formulas. These are circuits uh, for which if you write them, they look like trees. Okay? And the, you could have arbitrary circuits. You could have CNF formulas. So these would be circuits which are just ands of ors of variables or their negations. And so you could take different restrictions of circuits, but sort of put different uh, limits on how well they can operate in parallel and, and sort of how much they reuse computations. And for any such class, you can define a separate uh, CSAT problem for that circuit class C, where it just says, given a, a circuit K from the class, is there a satisfying assignment? Is there an assignment, some input assignment, uh, which makes the circuit output one? Okay, so this, for, this CSAT problem is basically MP complete for essentially all interesting circuit classes C, but nevertheless, it's solvable by exhaustive search. Just trying all possible assignments, evaluating it, see what you get, see if any print one, that works. Okay. Nevertheless, there have been improvements over exhaustive search over the years. So for simple enough circuits, we can find faster algorithms that beat two to the end. So for, for three SAT, for example, so in the 
three set problem. It's a three CNF. You can think of this in, in terms of circuits as having a, uh, an AND of unbounded fan in, so as many uh, wires going into the AND as you want, and ORs, but each OR has fan in at most three. So at most three inputs coming in, and the inputs can be input variables or their negations. Okay? So in that case, we can, we can actually get something much faster than to the end. Much, well, I mean, it's actually quite fast. It's 1.3 to the end. Okay. And for four set, we can also get an improvement, but, but um, it's slightly closer to to the end. And for case set in general, um, we can get algorithms of the form two to the n minus n over a constant c times k. But right as k gets larger and larger, uh, this exponent gets closer and closer to just two to the n. Okay. And these results are due to many different authors, and the best known results so far, this, these results here are due to Hurtley from 2011. But nevertheless, all known algorithms for k-set have the property that as k goes to infinity, the base of the exponent in the running time converges to 2. So as you see, as, as k goes to infinity here, if you think about what is the base of the exponent, what would this look like? It's converging uh, to 2. So for k equals 1,000, this is going to be like 1.99 something. Okay. And um, it's a big open problem whether or not you can do better than this. So whether or not you can just have something like that runs in 1.9 to the n, and it works for k set for all constants k, or 1.7 to the n, that works for all constants k. And this is, this is um, a problem that people have been studying very extensively in the last few years, and it's, it's known as the strong exponential time hypothesis. The hypothesis that it cannot be solved faster is called the strong exponential time hypothesis. So for these very simple uh, circuits, we can get faster algorithms, and we can relax the circuits a little bit, uh, but the running times get weaker and weaker as we relax them and allow for more expressive circuits. So the next expressive class is AC0, um, and that's, that's where we have constant depth and or and not gates. So, so in CNF, we have basically depth two. We have an and of ors of inputs and negations. So in AC0, we can have depth three, ands, ors, and or, I mean, we could have any, any fixed constant depth, and that's, that's AC0, okay? So, so in a certain sense, this corresponds to something like constant parallel time. Um, so it, it seems to be a rather restricted class, and indeed there are lower bounds known for this class. And correspondingly, it was shown by Impagliazzo, Matthews, and Paturi that uh, the satisfiability problem for AC0 can also be solved in slightly less than then to the end. So, so when S is the size and D is the depth, you get an improvement that looks something like this. So I guess the, the main thing to point out is as the depth gets larger and as the size gets larger, this algorithm gets worse and worse, as you, as you would expect. So as the complexity of, this, of the circuit increase more and more, we get weaker and weaker uh, sad algorithms. Okay. So, an, another example of this is just going slightly uh, further beyond AC0 is this class ACC, um, which is constant depth and or not, but you throw in some new type of gate. So, for example, so a mod M gate. And so you can think of M as equal to just some fixed constant like 6. So a mod 6 gate takes some arbitrary number of inputs, and it outputs 1 if and only if the sum of the bits are divisible by 6. It turns out that, I mean, this looks like a really stupid <laughs> little uh, operation, but it turns out that this operation is really, really hard to analyze lower bounds on. Really, really hard. And but so here's like an example of s such a circuit. This is a depth three circuit with some mod six gates and some ands and ors in it. Okay. And so something that I showed recently is, in fact, this algorithm does have, so this problem ACC set does have a non-trivial uh, sat algorithm. So you can solve it in 2 to the n minus n to the epsilon time for some epsilon less than 1 that depends on whatever modulus you have and, and whatever constant depth you have. And it works for, say, uh, up to 
quasi-polynomial size circuits. So it certainly works for all polynomial size circuits. Okay. All right. So, so that's one uh, uh, relaxation. Going even further, uh, we can talk about De Morgan formula set. So these are formulas. So again, circuits which look like trees uh, when, you, when you write them out. And these have and, or, and not gates. And each gate, let's say, has fan in at most two. Okay? So the ors and ands have, have at most two inputs each. So Santanam showed that this problem it also has a slightly faster algorithm, but it only works for linear size formulas and slightly, slightly better than linear size formulas. And there's some trade-off between the, the running time improvement you get and the constant in front of uh, the n here. So, so for cn size formulas for different constants c, you get different um, algorithms here. Okay. And then going up one level further with, uh, so where you have formulas over and or not and this XOR operation I was talking about, other the, the equals operation, uh, Seto and Tomaki showed just last year that in fact you can get slightly better set algorithms for these as well. Okay? And what's interesting about a lot of these different uh, algorithms is, is that they draw on previous lower bound techniques. So they sort of open up what's going on in the lower bound proofs and use this to, to figure out how to get a faster set algorithm um, for those circuits. But then, so once you move up a little bit more and you go to things like, say, circuit set, generic circuits over n or not, say, of, of, of size s, it's completely wide open. It, it really is completely wide open. So the, just the stupid algorithm of 2 to the n times s on, say, a reasonable computation model is the best that we know how to do. And I, yeah, I would like to see just any, any progress on this whatsoever. Surely exhaustive search is not the best. Surely you can get something better here than just trying everything. But uh, as far as I know, that's, that's the best is known. Okay. So, so for circuits of size S with n inputs, to the n times S, that's the best is known. Okay. So, so that's um, a summary of what's known about circuit SAT and various uh, restrictions. So there are other kinds of circuit analysis problems which can also be interesting. So, so another type focuses on analyzing functions directly. So you're given the function in a sense as input, and you want to say something about the circuits um, that can compute this function. So, so here the input is going to be the truth table of an n-bit Boolean function f. So it's just going to list uh, all possible outputs of the Boolean function according to some ordering on the inputs. So to the impossible inputs, just lists what all the possible outputs are. Okay. And the output that you want here, the kind of thing you want to learn is some property of, say, the minimum size circuits which are computing this function. So I give you the entire function's value on all inputs, and I want to know something about this function's circuit complexity. How, how many gates do I need to represent this circuit is with the minimum number of gates? Okay. So a canonical example of this is is the circuit minimization problem, which was actually introduced by uh, Yablonsky in 1959 in, in Russia. And so there the input is the truth table of a function, just as before, but you also get a parameter s. And the, you want to decide is the minimum size of a circuit computing f at most s. So you think of the circuits being over and and or and not. You're, I give you the entire description of the function just as a truth table. And I want to know, um, you know maybe there's a polynomial size circuit, a very, a very small circuit compared to the truth table size, which will, which will uh, compute this function. So I just want to know, say, if this is true or not. Now, there's not a whole lot known about this problem, in fact. Um, so it's, it's widely conjectured that this problem is not in polynomial time. But proving that it's NP-complete, it doesn't seem to be NP-complete either. So there are results showing that if you use the, if you have like very efficient uh, reductions showing that it's NP-complete, then you would get some very unlikely results. So it doesn't seem to be NP-complete either. It just seems to be one of these NP-intermediate problems, which is neither NP-complete nor NP. Because, so if it were in polynomial time, in fact, such an algorithm uh, would contradict all conventional wisdom in cryptography. In fact, you could use it to just break uh, pseudo any pseudorandom generator candidate. 
in fact. So it's worth thinking about what it means by polynomial time here and to try to understand why it's so difficult to, to, to think about this problem. So polynomial time means polynomial in the size of the truth table. So it's polynomial in two to the n. That seems like an awful lot of time for something that, for a function that's on n variables. Nevertheless, trying to say, trying to even say, distinguish between functions which have circuit complexity at most n squared and those which don't. So naively, that would just be exhaustive search. So you could, you could take two to the n squared times, say, log n time, and just try all n squared size circuits and see if any of them compute the function. But getting two to the order n, polynomial and two to the n, this, this is open. So, so sort of paradoxically, it is known that for restricted circuit classes, the problem does become NP-complete. So minimizing, so, uh, so given a truth table, finding the minimum DNF, so an OR of ANDs of variables or negations, this is NP-complete. And the reason why you can show this is NP-complete is because there are some really, really strong lower bounds on what DNFs can compute. So it's a strange set of affairs where, like, because the, ex the logical expressions are actually weaker, the problem becomes harder to solve. But, but when you're trying to, to estimate circuit complexity, it, it doesn't seem to be NP-complete. And so one very interesting open problem is to just try to find any improvement over exhaustive search. So this is, again, a problem you could solve by exhaustive search. You could just, given this parameter s, try all possible circuits of size s, just try them all, look at the truth tables that they print and see if any of these truth tables equal your input. You could do that. Um, but yeah, just try to improve over exhaustive search at all. You know, try to keep in, from enumerating all uh, circuits. So, so Ryan, yeah. could you repeat what, what would be the consequences if, I mean, circuit minimization is NP-complete? If it were NP-complete. So, so, um, so what's known is that if it were NP-complete according to, like, say, AC0 reductions, um, then I think you would get some very unexpected things like, like uh, NX, NX equals X or something like this. So you, you would get some really unexpected things. But it doesn't rule out showing NP-completeness with respect to polynomial time reductions. So, so it is, maybe it is NP-complete, but the, I guess the point is that the, reduct the problems which we know how to prove NP-complete, essentially all of them are also NP-complete when you have really we weak reductions, like these little localized gadgets. So any localized gadget reduction is, is almost certainly not going to, to show it's NP-complete. That, that's, that's what we know. Does that, does that help? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Any, any more questions? Okay, so, so this topic of designing algorithms for analyzing circuits, it just constitutes, so one very small facet of this area of exact algorithms for NP-hard problems, where you say, uh, well, I want to solve this problem, I want to solve it exactly, but I just want, so I don't expect to solve it in polynomial time, I'll just try to solve it as fast as I possibly can. And so running times between polynomial time and two to the n are, are the, the game here. So this is a really active research area. So most of these references are quite recent. There are many cool open problems besides the ones I mentioned. There are just many problems for which just improving on exhaustive search, the stupidest possible algorithm, is, is open. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's circuit analysis algorithms in a nutshell. So now I'll move to circuit complexity, uh, lower bounds. So, so as I was saying earlier, circuits are a really good model for finite functions, okay? But when we talk about circuit complexity um, in terms of, say, sol like, are there efficient circuits solving things like the SAT problem? The SAT problem is an infinite language. There are infinitely many circuits which are satisfiable and, and infinitely many which aren't. And so we have to think about how we can define what does it mean to have a circuit, circuit complexity of an infinite language and when we think about how to do it, it naturally leads to the, the following sort of situation. So the idea is that we allow a separate logical circuit, A sub n, that gets run on inputs of length n. So for every n, we have a separate logical circuit, A sub n. 
Okay, so we have some infinite family of circuits, one for each input length. So when I get an input of length 1,000, I would send it to something like a sub 1,000, the circuit for a sub 1,000, it would output a bit. Okay, so this is how we can talk about having circuits which compute even infinite languages. So we just imagine having infinite computational model, just some infinite string of circuits, and we don't put any bounds, say, on the com how efficient it is to construct such circuits. They could just fall from heaven, e each one of them. So it's an infinite computational model. Okay. So efficiency in this model um, is denoted by the class P poly, which is the class of problems solvable with one of these infinite families of circuits, so that there exists a constant k, so that for all n, the size of the nth circuit is bounded by into the k. So the, the circuits can be growing as n increases, but they don't grow by too much. They only grow polynomially. Okay. So this is giving us some explicit kind of trade-off between the size of the computation and the inputs being fed to the computation. Okay. Okay. So this infinite computational model, and because it's infinite, it allows you to do some, some pretty funky things. So it allows you to solve some undecidable problems with it. So if you take, for example, the string of n ones, so, so just consider only those one of the n's such that the nth Turing machine halts on blank tape. Okay. This is an undecidable problem. It's not hard to show this is undecidable. Nevertheless, it is contained in p poly. Do you see why? Yeah, it makes it so, so I can just sort of, I'll, I'll show you real quick. How much time do I have left? No, no I mean, okay. So, yeah, so suppose uh, the first Turing machine halts on uh, blank tape. Okay, according to some ordering on Turing machines. But the second Turing machine doesn't. Okay. Okay. So, so then um, my circuit on, say, um, my circuit C1 will just, um, just output whatever, X1. So it will output this, it, it will uh, accept when I give it a 1 and reject when I give it a 0. Okay, but for C2, um, I want this thing to never accept any string of length 2. So I could, for example, take the and of x1 and not x1, x1 and not, and just leave x2 over here. And this thing will, will output 0 on every input. Okay, and I could just design a separate circuit like this. So either the circuit is just going to output 0 on everything, or let's say the nth circuit halt, so let's say uh, the nth Turing machine halts on blank tape, then I'll just take the and of x1 through xn, for that's my nth circuit, okay? And so on the string of n1s, this will output 1, on everything else it will output 0. So when I, give, when I have infinitely many different circuits, one for each input length, I can solve, the, solve this problem, okay? But clearly I'm encoding the halting problem directly <laughs> into this thing, but it's, it's an infinite computational model, so it's possible to do that. Okay, so this is when the nth tree machine halts on black tape. So that's when it halts, and when it doesn't halt, I just set up some dummy circuit like this, which will output zero on everything. So it'll take x1 and not x1 and, and take the and of them, which is always zero. So, so when you have this ability to have a separate uh, circuit for each input length, a separate program, then you can do all kinds of funky things. Okay? And what this means is that the usual techniques that we have in complexity and computability are basically useless for, for trying to prove a strong glor balance on p-poly. So I mean, note that these are trivially polynomial sized circuits. They, I mean, they're sort of very easy to construct. Are there any, any questions about it? Does it make sense? Okay. Okay, so, um, so most Boolean functions 
require really huge circuits. So we'd like to find functions uh, or understand when functions have high circuit complexity and when they don't. But so if you pick a random Boolean function, in other words, you flip a fair coin with probably a half, you make it output one or make it output zero in each of the two in input strings, you just get some random string, this is going to require high circuit complexity. And the way to see this is just a, a simple counting argument. You count up the number of circuits of size less than 2 to the n over n, and the total number of possible Boolean functions is 2 to the 2 to the n, and the number of such circuits of size 2 to the n over n is smaller than that, so there must be, in fact, uh, it's much smaller than that, so some fraction of that. So a randomly chosen function is going to have really high circuit complexity. Okay. But nevertheless, we can say, okay, but what about the functions we want to compute? Okay. Random functions, maybe they come up, maybe they don't, but what about normal problems that we want to solve? So what normal algorithms, those computable by Turing machines, can be simulated in, in p-poly? So this notion of efficiency, but with infinitely many circuits. Uh, we know that non-uniformity can be very powerful. There are some um, undecidable problems they can solve. Um, but, we, but for all we know, they could be super, super powerful. So a huge open problem is whether non-deterministic exponential time is contained in p-poly. Okay? So in English, this says, can all problems that have exponentially long solutions, verifiable in exponential time, be solvable with polynomial size circuits? When I get to lay out a separate circuit for each input link, can I then magically go from exponentially long solutions to polynomial size computations? This sounds uh, completely absurd. Um, we think exponentials are much, much bigger than polynomials, and there must be computations you can encode uh, with, say, exponentially long solutions. You cannot encode with polynomial size circuits, but it's actually open. Uh, I think the main reason that it's open is that we haven't had uh, a good idea of how to approach such problems. Okay. Uh, and the big impediment is, is this non-constructivity condition on circuit complexity. So given infinite pre-processing time, given infinite time, arbitrary amount of time to construct the circuits, can we then, after this amount of time, solve any exponential time problem with just polynomial size computation? If this were true, it would totally contradict our understanding of, of efficiency. So, um, so it's generally conjectured in complexity theory that NP is not in P poly. So in other words, the circuit sat problem, things like that, we believe they cannot be solved in P poly. Um, uh, this is just because we, we think that if this were true, then it would mean that, okay, somewhere out there, there is some hardware design that maybe someone can find, maybe they can't, because it could take forever to construct. There's some hardware design which is really efficient, uses very few transistors, and can just solve any set instance that you want uh, within some reasonable range. So that, that's what such a thing would say. If NP were in P-poly, that's what such a thing would say. For any fixed input size, which is generally what we're looking at in practice, so up to some fixed bound, I can come up with some hardware design that will just solve this thing very efficiently. Um, and the only impediment is the fact that constructing this design is, takes a really long time. So it just, it just seems that this is not true, but it, it could be. This, uh, the, as we've seen, they, they can be quite powerful. So, so the proof of such a theorem, if we could prove that NP is not in P-poly, then it, it would help us get concrete trade-offs between the sizes of inputs and the sizes of computations in general. We could actually start saying things like, oh, well, any computer which is going to solve the SAT problem will take some size bigger than the universe, so I can set up some crypto based on long enough SAT instances and be assured that no one is going to be able to build a computer in this universe that will be able to solve the problem, so I, I'm secure. So, so you could try to say something like every logical circuit solving all SAT instances on 10 to 8 clauses requires at least 10 to the 60 gates. Okay? These numbers are totally made up, but one would expect that from some proof of a say, computation size input trade-off, you would be able to extract such parameters. Okay. Okay. So uh, I would like to actually mention a conjecture uh, by the great mathematician Koma Groff. And so according to Lin Levin, he, is conjectured, he conjectured that P has linear size circuits. 
so that, in fact, every problem is solvable in polynomial time, say n to the 10, n to the 100, n to the 1,000. There's some linear size circuit family, so just order n size circuits, one for each input length, uh, which will solve the problem. Um, so he based his conjecture based on some solution of some Hilbert problem, which I've forgotten about. But anyway, I, I think it's a very uh, compelling conjecture because if it were true, it would be remarkable. So, so if you could prove that this were true, then you would have a proof of P different from NP um, relatively easily. So you can show that if P equals NP, then in fact such circuits do not exist for polynomial time. So, so proving Kolmogorov's conjecture would, would resolve uh, the P versus NP. Okay. So, uh, so I guess I'm, my five minutes are up. Sorry. Okay, so I'll stop here.